occur to me, Andy Atkins was the, uh, the uh, director at that time, and he'd gone all over the world with the gospel. I said, Andy, you know, I'm kind of scared to go to this Haiti thing. Oh, tell me about it. So I told him all my excuses, and he let me go on and on and on and give all my excuses. And at the end of it, he said, Fleming, I got a word from Jesus for you. Just go. Just go. Go do it. And so I did. And the trip, it was life-changing. And to see the people there material, materially so little, but spiritually so much. And the vibrancy they had in the Lord. And, and they had a baptismal service in the middle of this conference. And so 18 candidates, you know, uh, walked down through the city of Cabaret where the night before there were voodoo rituals. And, and now they're walking through the town. They're going to go over to a river and, and they're going to get baptized. And they're singing praise songs. And the whole city's watching. And it was just so moving to hear their testimonies and, and what the Lord was doing down there. It was incredible. It was transformational. And so, again, I'm preaching to myself. And so what, what this text reminds me is this. The transformational phrase in the kingdom of God is this. Here I am, Lord. Send me. But conversely, one of the most restricting phase, phrases in the kingdom of God is, here I am, Lord. Send somebody else. And so this text is a text by which Jesus is encouraging the church to go through the open doors that he's presenting to them. In verse 8, and this is, this is sort of an emphatic command, Jesus says to the church of Philadelphia, See, I have placed before you an open door. I want you to look at this. I want you to mark this. I want you to observe this. And, and, and Jesus is saying it discreetly, but he's saying it diplomatically. And what he's saying is this. Look, everybody, all you members of the Philadelphia church, all you individuals whom I've changed, I'm placing before you an open door. I'm giving you a fantastic opportunity. Don't hesitate. Don't, don't deliberate and kind of hem and haw and give excuses. But please, for my sake... And the expansion of the kingdom's sake, say, yes, here am I, and go through the door. Now, we don't know exactly what the door was for the Church of Philadelphia. We know Philadelphia was founded by the king of Pergamum, Attalus Philadelphius II, back in 140 BC. He was a patron of the arts and sciences. Philadelphia was a, a city of junctions, a uh, highway to Mysia and Lydia and other cities. And, and King Attalus saw it as a strategic launching point for the Hellenization of the rest of the world, a, a place to promote and forward and advance the cause of the Greco-Roman world and the Greco-Roman way of life. And so many commentators believe that it was this initiative to utilize Philadelphia as a doorway or a gateway to Hellenize the rest of the world that, that prompted Jesus to say, in a sense, forget about King Attalus's door. Forget about his door of wanting to Hellenize the rest of the world. I'm opening a door for you. I'm opening a door for the gospel. Please go through the door. I'm your Lord, and I'm your King, and I'm giving you this opportunity to minister to me. Open doors. Open doors. And so as we just quickly look at the rest of the text, I just want to, I want to give three or four aspects of, of open doors and, and, and what open doors come like and how they come and, and what we can learn about open doors from the text. The first thing I want to say about open doors, open doors start with the master key, Jesus Christ. They start with the master key, Jesus Christ. In verse 7, these are the words of him who holds the key of David. Now you got to go with me on this. This is a quote from Isaiah 20 that refers to a prophecy of double fulfillment. In Isaiah 20, 22, we read, Eliakim, servant to King Hezekiah, will have placed on his shoulders the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. We know Eliakim was a servant to King Hezekiah. He 
literally had the keys to Jerusalem and to the temple, access to every place, the master key to the city. But the more you read through the book of Isaiah, you realize house of David, the city of God, the temple of God, the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is like Eliakim, only his keys, he being the master key, leads to eternal life and to the unlocking to the entrance of the kingdom of God and access into all the riches of eternity. Remember in John 10, Jesus stood up and said, Hey, I am the door. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will find rich pasture and be able to go in and out and have great fellowship. And so the first thing when we think about open doors and, and following the doors the Lord gives to us as leaders and followers of him, we have to first go through the main door, Jesus Christ being the master key. It's Christ's door and our association and new relationship with him that unfolds the rest of a life that serves him by going through other open doors. So, so we got to come to Christ first. That's the first door we got to go through if we want to go through other open doors. And so maybe you're here this morning and you've heard about Jesus and you've maybe studied about Jesus. You're reading about him in, in his word, but you don't really know him yet. He's not in your heart personally. And you need, you need to go through that door. You need to accept Christ as your Savior and as your Lord and recognize that Jesus died on the cross for, for my sin and my failings and my faults. I know, I know I fall short. I know I'm a sinner. But Jesus takes upon himself on the cross my sin. He pays the penalty for me. So that when I accept Christ into my life, he washes and cleanses me of my sin. And I now walk with him and he floods and fills me by his Holy Spirit. And he becomes my Lord and my Savior. And so the first thing about open doors, we have to understand, they start with the master key, Jesus Christ. And maybe this morning you want to receive Christ as your Savior and begin this journey of following through other doors of opportunity. The second thing I want to say about open doors, open doors, and this is a biggie, are the sovereign work of the Lord. Isn't it amazing? What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. And so here we are in our very politically correct world. I mean, we're in the middle of a provincial election, and, and uh, we know that more and more often, you know, believers are being marginalized in our society. And so sometimes the devil wants us to think, well, you know, we're being marginalized, and it's harder and harder, and so there's less and less opportunity. And, and what's great about the text is God says to us, don't worry about opportunity. You don't have to force opportunities. I will create them for you. What you need to do is, you need to be aware of those opportunities when they come, and you need to take them and go through the door. What he opens, no one can shut. And so God in his, his sovereignty is working behind the scenes in sometimes very difficult circumstances, politically or, or geopolitically or whatever, and how can we share the gospel in this, and huge doors open before us. And that's a unique opportunity. And that is God that does that. And so I, I wrote in my notes, his will cannot be opposed. He can orchestrate openings where you'd least expect. His governing of opportunities is unlimited. On Paul's second missionary journey, he tries to sail to Asia, but is forbidden by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit closes the door. Then he tries to sail to Bithynia, but again, he's forbidden by the Lord. The Lord's like, no, you're not going there. And then all of a sudden, Paul comes to Troas. He has a vision from a man of Macedonia. Come over to Macedonia and help us. And at that point in the gospel journey, Paul is obedient to go to Macedonia and he brings the gospel to Europe for the first time. And because he went through that open door, the gospel takes root there and to this day has impact on us sitting here this morning. What he opens, no one can shut. I remember pastoring at Springville in Stouffville and high school Bible studies and, and uh, outreach ministries on campuses and public schools were closing all over the place. And for whatever reason, it was only the Lord. We had this incredible opportunity at the high school 
we got a youth unlimited uh, missionary, a girl, and she went in there. We, we, we supported her and all kinds of Christian events she could put on and Bible studies and students were hearing the gospel and some of them coming to the Lord and it just kept going and going. Meanwhile, other high schools are closing their doors, but God for us opened that one. And so we just realized, for us, that was a unique God thing that was happening. And because God did it, we went through it. And so I, I think sometimes I can get discouraged as I kind of look around our society, living in Canada, and it's kind of choking out the gospel, and then I can make the wrong conclusion, you know, well, there's not going to be opportunity. But God is working behind the scenes to open doors. And nobody is going to stop him. The key is for you and I, when he does that, we need to be willingly going through them. We got a, we got a church plant down in Toronto, Liberty Grace Church, uh, Daryl Dash is pastor down there. And it's all these high-rise condos. You've been down there, like condo after condo after condo, and, and tens of thousands of people within a city block. But how do you get in there and begin to share what you're doing in the local church? And, and you just can't walk in these buildings and knock on doors or give out pamphlets. You can't do that. And uh, Nathan uh, Fullerton had been down there as a, a church planting uh, an, an intern. And uh, he, as he was sharing with me how the Lord was opening. I go, Nathan, how do you get it, the word out of your guy's new church and, and begin to build relationships? He said, well, one thing God gave to me was a love of board games. I'm like, board, what? Because I love board games. I'm not a board game guy. My wife loves board games. I'm more kind of the fishing golf kind of guy. Uh, my wife loves board games, so we got a marriage thing there. But anyway, that's another sermon. But I said, Nathan, he goes, yeah, I go online and I get in chat rooms with people. I go, hey, I got a new board game. I just got one from Germany. And uh, all the instructions are in German, but that's okay. Uh, and uh, in the chat room, hey, you want to be interested in coming over to my, uh, my condominium and playing board games? And so, like, he puts that out online, and eight or ten people from the condo, the little village down there, they show up at his condo, they come in, they play board games in German, whatever, they figure it out. And now, all of a sudden, Nathan's building relationships with neighbors and people who are around. And Nathan, what brings your family here? Well, believe it or not, it's incredible. You know, we're planting a, a church. You're kidding. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, let me tell you about it. Da, 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 da. And he's building relationships, sharing Christ. Some are coming to the church all through board games. Who does that? God does that. God does that. What he opens, no one can shut. And so the encouragement for us is this. Open doors are the sovereign work of the Lord. And so as we go out this week, we have to just realize behind the scenes, the Holy Spirit's already working in circumstances, in the landscapes of our, of our backyards with neighbors or, or people at work or as we travel or people at university or school or wherever. The Lord is working behind the He's going to open doors of opportunity. And he's asking us to have the courage of the Holy Spirit to go through those doors. Open doors start with the master key, Jesus Christ. Open doors are the sovereign work of the Lord. Now look at this. Here's the third one. This third one blows me away and it's speaking to me, believe me. Open doors come to those, you ready? With little strength. What? Yeah, look what Jesus says in verse 8. I know that you have little strength. Now isn't that interesting? The antagonists in the book of Revelation are always bigger and larger and more intimidating than the main characters. So these saints in these churches are fighting these gigantic looming enemies. They're fighting characters like Caesar who represents the massive empire of Rome. Revelation calls it the seed of Satan. They're fighting characters like Jezebel, that wicked queen killing God's prophets at will and promoting Baal. They're, they're up against characters like Balaam, that deceitful prophet of God who goes over to the dark side and seeks to curse God's people on behalf of the king of Moab. And so what, what, what is happening? Well, what is happening is this is that as we seek to go through these open doors, the enemy is there, and the enemy is saying, we are so big, what difference are you going to make? 
And so, as I was thinking about going to Haiti, you know, here's this island, and, and for years and years and years, all kinds of issues and problems and, and things way beyond, you know, people to work through and be able to solve. And the enemy saying to me, Fleming, don't waste your time going down there. What difference are you going to make? You're just one little voice down there. And the issue is this big, and, and you're just, you know, you're just kind of a nobody. And, and you begin to feel intimidated, and you begin to feel you have little strength. And it's amazing how Jesus is saying, I know that you have little strength. I know you feel tired. I, I know you feel intimidated. I know you're fighting against temptation to quit because you don't think you're going to make any difference. I know, I know, Bobby, you're, you're 62 years old. You're getting grayer and fatter and, and you want to kind of retire and play golf and let somebody else do it. I, I know that. I know you have little strength. But I'm opening up this door and I am asking you to go through it. And it's a funny thing. When we feel we have little strength, what happens? We stop relying on ourselves. And we throw ourselves on the Lord. Because we begin to realize, God, without you, I can do nothing. This ministry opportunity, it's intimidating. It's fearful. It can flood me with anxiety. I know the enemy's saying, you're not going to make any difference if you go in there. Tons of other people have tried and nothing's ever happened. And yet the Lord is saying, hey, I know you feel like that. But I'm opening up this door and I want you to go through. You know, some of the best work by God's grace I've ever done is when I've been the most tired. I was on a mission trip to Antigua. Now somebody had to go. And it was in February. And we were down there doing training on small groups and stuff like that. There's a team of us down there and, and it was just one of the, we were on the radio station down there. I was on television. I, I, it was unbelievable. The promotion and then the different meetings we had. At, a very busy time and at the end of the, we were doing these services in a church and at the end of the, the end of the week I was just saying to the team, I am so exhausted. I am so tired. Let, you know, we got one more meeting to go. Let's just go to the meeting. We'll have it and then we can go home. And, and you know, it's been a great time but, but I'm exhausted. And so we're driving the jeep to the last meeting at the church and we're going along and all of a sudden there's a little cabana parade going on and uh, it's the island of Antigua and so you know they got dancers and they got different people dressed up and and the uh the guy in the jeep who's Richard McGowan he's like oh look there's a little parade I go Richard forget the parade let's just get to the church the church is just around the corner over there no no this is kind of you know local culture I'm like forget it let's just get there I'm exhausted and, and anyway a guy comes out of the crowd now he's smoking something now, it's not a cigarette, okay? So you do, I'll just let you go from there. So he, he comes over to the Jeep, and, and I'm like, Richard, let's go, let's go. No, no, I'm going to talk to this guy. So the window goes down, and he takes a big drag, you know, and whoosh, blows it in, you know, to the Jeep. And, and hey, how are you guys doing? You know, Richard, oh, we're doing fine. Now, I'm in the back with my Bible, like, let's go, let's go, you know. No, no, Richard's talking to this guy. And the next thing I hear, do you want to come with us? <laughs> And I'm in the back seat like, you got to be kidding me. And so the guy comes in, hey man, how are you? You want some? You know, I go, no, no, after, after. Anyway, no. And, and, and so I'm in the back. I'm like, I, I don't believe this. So we get to the church. We do our thing. We go back. We go home. About a year later, a year later, Richard phones me. He said, Bobby, yes. Remember the mission tree? Yes, I remember. I remember the last night and the last day and, and how, what a bad attitude you had? <laughs> I'm like, yes, yes, I do remember that. Remember that guy in the, yeah, you know what? I just talked to the church, and that guy has not stopped going to the church since we took him that night. In fact, he's finding a whole new family that loves him and cares for him, and things are starting to fall away out of his life. He hasn't accepted the Lord yet. He's reading his Bible. He's got some guys doing prayer and Bible study with him. And it's just an incredible story of victory. And all of that in the middle of the sense that I got to go home. I'm exhausted. Folks, I'm tired. I'm tired. I've been doing this 40-something years. I'm tired. I, 
I got to be honest with you. I have little strength. And the Lord is saying to me, I don't know what he's saying. When I read that, and the Lord's like, Bobby, I know you have little strength. But you're not done till you're dead. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not done till you're dead. And you're not dead yet. And I know you're weary, but don't get weary in well-doing. And so just, I'm going to open doors for you. I'm sovereign. And I'll do it in ways you, you're not going to believe, but I need you to go through those doors. And I know sometimes it can be intimidating and it can fill you with anxiety and you may not feel you're going to do very much, but you'd be amazed at what you'll do in my strength and not yours. And so along with the ride and the adventure of open doors just comes that sense of weariness and that sense of intimidation at times. And just that sense of little strength. And God is just encouraging us, just go through in my strength. And you'll be amazed at what I can do. And the final thing, just in closing, I want to say this about open doors. Open doors come as a result of faithfulness. I know your deeds. I know you've kept my word and not denied my name. I know that you have kept my command and endured patiently. Faithfulness, just being faithful. This church, it wouldn't take long. How has this church been so healthy and done so well? And, and all these kids come up here so exciting and encouraging because people are faithful. There are people here, they're just, they put their, their hand to the plow and they serve and they serve and they serve and they serve. And they serve. They're just faithful. There's no magic bullet there's just that sense of being steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work and the Lord, because as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so you all know the story of the Chinese bamboo tree. And I've told this story many times. You put the seed of the Chinese bamboo tree in the ground, you water it, you fertilize it the first year, nothing happens. You water it, for second year, nothing happens. Third year, fourth year, in the fifth year, of the Chinese bamboo tree. It grows 60 feet in 90 days. 60 feet in 90... How long does it take to grow a Chinese bamboo tree? It takes five years. But here's the thing. You don't see anything happening the first four years. Folks, as we share Christ with people, we pray for people in our extended family, we, we're, we're talking to people at work, we're going on mission trips, we're trying to serve in the local church here. Sometimes you don't see fruit for a long time. But I'm going to tell you, underneath the soil of people's hearts, the Lord is doing a work. Now you can't see it, but it is happening. And so what, what's that mean? Just stay faithful. Keep praying. Keep giving. Keep serving. Go through those doors. Give yourself to the ministry. And you will reap eventually a harvest for Christ's glory if you don't give up. It just takes time. There's no silver bullet. And so the Lord is just saying to me and to all of us, just stay faithful. Open doors come to those who are faithful. And the Lord, even though we feel weary, will bring harvest to our labors. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Can we all say that this morning? I'm, I'm challenged to say it. Here I am, Lord send me. Let's just bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege of giving us opportunities. We're, we're sometimes trying to make them ourselves. Forgive us for that. We, we want to serve you, and, and, and you're our sovereign God, and in a world that is so broken and has marginalized to so many different degrees our freedom in Christ, you're still at work and doing incredible things. And we just need eyes to discern those doors of opportunity with our neighbors and friends and family and, and uh, groupings that we get into at work and, and wherever we are, just enjoying ourselves. Help us to be sensitive to your spirit, to the open doors. Lord, there's wide open doors for serving you in this local church. 
And we just pray for a, a willingness again to dive in and to go through those doors and be used by you. And we praise you for the privilege of serving you in the local church. Uh, Jesus, you love the church and you gave yourself for her. And I just thank you for those who are here this morning. Bless them. And for so many who give of themselves in ministry here, I just praise you for lives that are being changed and for the harvest that you do bring as we are steadfast and immovable. So help us to go through those doors. May this summer be a reaping time for us and a courageous time to step out of the boat of our comfort zones and to serve you and go through those doors. And we praise you for what you're doing and for what you're going to do. And we ask these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that message. We're going to be closing uh, this morning with In Christ Alone. And maybe what we'll do is we'll stand in verse 2 as the kids are coming up. In Christ Alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone.
God bless you. Have a great week, everyone.